What really happened on resurrection morning? One of the most common accusations made by skeptics against the Bible is that the gospel records tell different and, they claim, contradictory accounts of the morning of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For instance, in John, Mary came to the tomb alone, but in other gospels, she came with a group of other women. In John, she left without seeing any angels, told the disciples that the body was stolen, and then came back to the tomb where she met Jesus. But in the other gospels, the group of women see angels that proclaim the resurrection. Then they run to tell the disciples that Jesus was risen, not that his body had been stolen, and they meet Jesus on the way as they're going to tell the disciples, not afterward. Is this a contradiction in scripture? Is it possible to harmonize these events or are the differing accounts proof that the gospels are not infallibly accurate? Well, I think we can be confident that the Bible is not an error, but if that's the case, how do we explain these accounts? What really happened on that Sunday morning? Well, before we can answer this question, we first need to list the elements of the story from each gospel to show specifically where they are different. First, who do they claim went to the tomb initially? Matthew lists Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Mark tells us that it was Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome. Luke tells us that it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and other women. And John only mentions Mary Magdalene. Now these are hardly contradictions because Matthew is probably just singling out two of the women who would be best known to his audience. Mark does the same, seeming to single out the same two women plus Salome. But Luke, who compiled many eyewitness testimonies for his gospel, wanted to also include Joanna, probably because she was one of his sources. John, on the other hand, seems to be only interested in telling this part of the story from Mary Magdalene's point of view, and I think that is very significant. I'll explain why in a few minutes. Anyway, just because the writers emphasize different personalities doesn't mean that the others weren't there. So this is definitely not contradictory. To say that Mary went to the tomb does not necessarily mean that she went alone. So next, what do these accounts say about when the party went to the tomb? Matthew tells us that it was as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week. Mark says, at the rising of the sun. Luke only states that it was very early in the morning, but John tells us that it was still dark when the women took their journey. Now at first, the statement that it was still dark may seem to contradict Matthew and Mark, which speak of the sun rising, but it really doesn't. Remember that this was probably a walk that took some time, perhaps an hour or maybe more. It's very reasonable to assume that the women might have left for the tomb while it was still dark and arrived there as the sun was coming up. In that case, they all seem to be telling complementary versions of the same story. John spoke of it being dark when they left, and Matthew and Mark speak of the sun starting to come up by the time they arrived. So far, these answers have been quite simple, but next, the reconciliation of these stories becomes a little more confusing. So let's press on. Concerning the angels, Matthew and Mark mention only one of them, and he's sitting on the stone that was rolled away in Matthew, but in Mark, he's sitting in the sepulcher on the right side. Then Luke tells us that there were two angels and says that they were standing by the women. Now these three accounts are not too difficult to harmonize because when Matthew mentions the angel, he seems to be describing the rolling away of the stone, which happened before the women got there. The angel rolled away the stone and sat on it, which caused the guards to faint and become as dead men. But it's reasonable to assume that by the time that the women arrived, this angel could have entered the sepulcher where they found him sitting on the right side as Mark describes. And Luke probably records two angels standing by them because he collected accounts from multiple women and learned that while some of the women were focused 
only on the angel on the right who spoke with them, other women must have had a better view inside the sepulcher and saw a second angel in there as well. Mark says that the angel was sitting and Luke has them standing. So maybe they were sitting while they waited for the women and they stood when the women arrived. So far, it all works pretty well together. But then there's John's account. You see, in the other three Gospels, the women are told by the angels that Jesus was risen and are commanded to go tell the disciples this news. But in John, who only mentions Mary, she didn't meet these angels initially. She ran to tell Peter and John not that Christ was risen, but that the body of Jesus had been stolen, or so she thought. She didn't see the angels until later when she returned to the tomb and the angels never told her that Jesus was risen. They simply ask why she's crying. Is this a contradiction? I admit it seems to be so at a casual glance. In three stories, she's with the women who are told by the angels that Jesus is risen before they tell the disciples. But in the fourth gospel, she sees the disciples before she ever meets the angels, and she doesn't think that Jesus is risen. She thinks that his body has been stolen. And that's not all. In Matthew, the women respond to the angels by running to tell the disciples, and on their way, Jesus met them and they worshipped him. In Mark, we're told that the women didn't tell anyone, and, as we said, in John, Mary doesn't see the angels until she returns to the tomb and she sees Jesus at the tomb, not on her way to tell the disciples. So, is there a version of these events that harmonizes all of the gospel accounts? I think so. To find the solution, let's follow these events, assuming that everything written in the gospels is true. Mary Magdalene leaves early in the morning while it is still dark with Mary the mother of James, Joanna, and the other women. Their mission? To go to the tomb to anoint the Lord's body for burial. On their way, they talk about the fact that the tomb is guarded by soldiers and they wonder how they will gain entrance to anoint the body. But as the sun begins to rise, they feel an earthquake as, out of sight to them, an angel rolls the stone away from the door and sits on it. The soldiers who are keeping the tomb faint and become as dead men. Then the angel enters the tomb, sitting down with another angel, and waits for the women to arrive. Now, when the women arrive at the tomb, they see the stone rolled away from the door and the soldiers lying on the ground and they wonder what has happened. You can imagine the thoughts that might be racing through their minds. Confusion, fear, sorrow. Where is the body? What if, at this juncture, the women act as individuals rather than as one group? What if Mary immediately assumes her worst fear, that the Jewish leaders have come and stolen the body of her Lord so that none may honor him in death? Judging by what we read in John, we know that this is what she was thinking. So when she saw the stone rolled away from the tomb, she immediately assumed a naturalistic explanation, jumped to the wrong conclusion, and ran from the tomb to tell Peter and John that the body had been stolen. But the rest of the women remain at the tomb, distraught but curious, and they enter into the sepulcher as described in Mark. Now, the tomb is a small space, so maybe they crowded into the opening and a few of them only saw one angel, but others in the front of the group saw two. The angels stand to greet them and announce to them the resurrection of Jesus Christ, charging them to go and tell his disciples. Then, filled with a combination of fear, wonder, and jubilance, the women depart to find the twelve disciples and tell them what they've seen. While this is happening, perhaps Mary has already found Peter and John. They were not necessarily in the same place as the other ten disciples. Perhaps they are not far from the tomb and she runs to tell them first because the other disciples are in a location that happens to be farther away. It makes sense that they are separate from the others because if Mary had told all twelve, 
they probably would have all run to the tomb to investigate. And the fact that Peter and John ran all the way to the tomb suggests that they weren't that far away. Perhaps they were even already on their way to the tomb when Mary found them. At any rate, Mary tells them that the body of Christ, as she believes, has been stolen because she left the group of women before they heard the angels announce the resurrection. Upon hearing that the body was stolen, Peter and John run to the sepulcher to investigate. John gets to the tomb first, but when he arrives, the other women have already finished speaking to the angels and have left to find the rest of the disciples. Peter arrives just after John, and they both take special note of the linen clothes lying in the tomb. John tells us that he saw the napkin that was about Christ's head not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. This, he says, was enough to make him believe. Now it seems that what he believed here was not that the body had been stolen, but rather that Jesus had risen. If someone had stolen the body, they wouldn't have left the clothes behind on purpose, and if the linen clothes had fallen off as they were stealing the body, the napkin wouldn't have been folded in a separate place from the rest. It's unclear as to whether Peter believed from this evidence, but it seems that John did. But Mary, having yet to see the linen clothes, still thinks that the body has been stolen. So while these two apostles left the tomb, either believing or wondering, Mary stayed behind, weeping. But perhaps she had scolded herself for leaving earlier without an investigation, so this time she actually stoops down and looks inside the sepulcher. This is when she sees two angels, but it's unclear whether she understood that they were angels. Perhaps, since she was seeing them from a distance at the door of the tomb, she may have thought that they were gardeners too and felt embarrassed for getting caught snooping in the tomb. Whatever was going through her mind, when they asked her why she was weeping, she replied that it was because, as she was convinced, someone had stolen the body of the Lord. Then she turned from the tomb and spotted a gardener standing near her. This man also asked her why she was weeping, and she replied, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Of course, this wasn't a gardener. It was, in fact, Jesus himself. Perhaps through her tears, her vision had blurred so that she did not recognize his face, but she still knew his voice. So his reply was simply to speak Mary's name, and she instantly knew who he was. Then, sometime probably shortly after Mary met the Lord at the tomb, the other women were still en route to tell the rest of the disciples the news. When Mark tells us that they left the tomb trembling and amazed, he uses Greek words that actually express that trembling had seized a hold of them. That's why he writes that they said nothing to anyone. They were literally in so much shock and amazement that they physically could not speak a word. Trembling had gripped them. Mark wasn't suggesting that this was a permanent condition. He only writes that for some period of time, they literally couldn't speak at all. Maybe this is why Jesus appeared next to these women in the way. Perhaps they wandered for some time through the streets of Jerusalem, completely unable to speak until, as Matthew tells us, Jesus, having finished his conversation with Mary at the tomb, went and met with the other women and they worshiped him. Maybe this is when they regained the strength to speak again and went on to tell the rest of the disciples. Now, some might wonder why Luke seems to say that Peter went to the tomb after the group of women told all of the disciples when John says that he and Peter went to the tomb after Mary told only them. Luke says it this way, that the women's words seemed as idle tales to the disciples, and they believed them not. Then arose Peter and ran to the sepulcher. But Luke doesn't say that all of the women in the group told all of the disciples at the same time. Mary was one of the women from the group, and she told two of the disciples, 
before the rest of the women told the rest of the disciples. So Peter did run to the sepulcher after he was told by someone from that group of women. It just may have happened to occur before the rest of the women told the rest of the disciples. Anyway, this version of events not only fits really well with everything we're told in the Gospels, but it also explains why John in his Gospel would tell the story only from the perspective of Mary Magdalene. Because Mary's story intersected with John's story on that morning. John's experience of the resurrection morning was he and Peter met a distressed Mary who was alone at the time and she was sure that the body had been stolen. So when John retells the account of the resurrection morning, he says that Mary went to the tomb and only mentions Mary because that's the part of the story that stuck in his mind because that was the part of the story that he was a part of. Now, I admit that I've done a little reading between the lines here, but I've at least demonstrated one version of events that fits with all of the gospel accounts, and I think it works really well. My point is not that my theories are all necessarily true, only that they fit and they prove that these accounts, though they each may bear different emphasis, all do work together in unity to tell one singular story. What do you think? How does my suggested harmony measure up with the statements given by the Gospel writers? Do you think there is a better way that these accounts may be unified? Given the abundance of evidence that supports the truth of the Gospel records, shouldn't we assume that they are true and that there is a good explanation for apparent contradictions, rather than just jumping to the conclusion that the Bible contains errors? I think so. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Now, before I go, I want to sincerely thank you for watching this video. If you like this content, don't forget to hit subscribe to support the channel and to see more content like this. And follow The Bible Explained on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash The Bible Explained. I really appreciate the support. Also, I want to remind you that the entire Bible is ultimately about one thing, the redemption of mankind by Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible tells us that all men are sinners and that we must pay for our sin against God for eternity in hell. That's definitely the bad news. But you see, the Bible is all about this one thing, the good news that Christ died to pay the penalty for our sin on the cross. Since your sin has been paid for by Christ, all that is left for you to do is to turn from your sin and accept His salvation by faith. If you've never accepted this gift of God by faith, won't you do that today? Leave a comment or send me a private message on Facebook and I'll be happy to talk to you more about having your sins forgiven by Jesus Christ.